Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Haldun Azari. I'm former president of this club, and I will be moderating this event. I have the honor to introduce to you today Mr. Khaled Omran Al Amri. He is the ambassador of United Arab Emirates in Japan in Tokyo. And uh, today, talks will be about the uh, situation in uh, Yemen, and mostly in recent developments in the port city of Al Hudaida. And also, uh, we will touch upon the energy supplies and uh, uh, especially oil to Japan from UAE. Uh, Ambassador Al Amri has deep ties to Japan. During the years prior to his diplomatic assignment, he earned a Bachelor of Science and Electrical Engineering from Tokai University in 2002, after which he obtained Master of Science in Engineering from uh, Shonan Institute of Technology in Fujisawa. And uh, he also, uh, Ambassador Al Amri, uh, served. Uh, he completed a year of service with the UAE uh, Navy in 2015 and also worked for the program manager at, uh, of the private investment cooperation Emirates Advanced Investment, EAI. Later on, he returned to the national forces as head of research and development at the cap uh, capability development department of the UAE land forces. And he was appointed uh, as a minister uh, for the property of uh, the United UAE embassy in Tokyo in March 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome our guest speaker Ambassador Al Amri. Thank you. This is on? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to be here with you today. And I would like to express my gratitude and appreciation for the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Before going to the topic, I would like to take this opportunity to express my heartfelt condolences to Japan government and people for the victims of the floods and landslide and landslides. And I wish the safety and the, reco and the quick re recovery. Um, I'd like to speak with you today about the recent development and situation in Yemen. In particular, the latest development and operation around the city and port of Hodeida, and the implication on regional global security and stability, as well as energy supplies to Japan and East Asia. And before going into details regarding the current military and humanitarian operation around Hodeida, please allow me to start by giving you some background information and facts. Going back time back to the time before the uh, recent operation. Then answering why did the Arab coalition intervene in Yemen conflict, in the Yemen conflict. After that, I would like to uh, talk about the current operation in Hodeida and followed by the questions and answer sessions. So allow me to start with facts about the Yemen conflict and try to answer the question why the coalition intervened. The Yemeni forces loyal to the legitimate government of Yemen and the Saudi-led Arab coalition, which my country, the UAE, is part of, are pitted against heavily armed non-state actors who threaten Yemeni regional and global security in a variety of ways. These non-state actors include, one, the Houthi militias, also called Ansarullah, a group having an extremist ideology closely allied to Hezbollah and supported and armed by Iran in violation of United Nations Security Council resolutions 2140, 2204, and 2216. Second, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. The most dangerous of Al-Qaeda affiliates, AQAP expanded territorial gains during political and security vacuum in Yemen making Mukalla as their de facto capital. And third, ISIS, the only terror outfit in history that formed a quasi-state with a huge territory under its control. ISIS established its branch in Yemen in November 2014 and is made up of former AQAP 
members and foreign fighters. They have active cells in Yemen, in Yemeni provinces, such as Lahij, Aden, Shabwa, Ta'az, and more. A number of grave provocations by the Houthi rebels preceded the Arab coalition's military intervention in Yemen. The following are only few examples. Houthi offensive in Tusan'a, taking control of most of the capital in September 2014. Houthi SCAD missile directed at Saudi oil installations in southern Saudi Arabia in December 2014. In the same month, a SCAD missile struck an airport near Jizan, causing significant damage. In January 2015, Houthi rebels reject the constitution proposed by government of Yemen and seize state TV stations, attacks presidential palace, force the government's resignation, and place President Hadi under, under house arrest. Several attempts were made by the Yemeni government and their GCC backers to resolve the conflict amic amicably. But the Houthi consistently, consistently rebuffed Yemeni government and GCC efforts to arrive at a negotiated settlement during 2014 until March 2015. Also, international efforts to end the crisis were rebuffed but by the rebels. United Nations sponsored national dialogue, United Nations resolutions, especially 2216, were important steps, but proved futile. And finally, when all efforts at making peace failed in March 2015, the Arab coalition forces intervened in Yemen based on the formal request from the Yemeni legitimate government. With the authority of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2216, which had been passed under the chap under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. Had it just been an internal issue between parties in Yemen, it could have been resolved politically. A military option was forced on the coalition because the conflict got exacerbated due to the role of Iran in fomenting and keeping alive the fault lines. A hypothetical parallel to this would be a similar situation in an European country or in Canada or in the former Soviet republics and the toppled government of these countries seeking help from the UK, Russia or the United States. The situation was particularly alarming as terror outfit AQAP was exploiting, exploiting the power vacuum in the country to expand territory. The ultimate aim of the military intervention was to force a political settlement, as evident by the coalition consistent support for the various efforts at the negotiated resolutions, be it the Kerry Initiative in Oman or UN mediated dialogue at that time. It's important to know that the decision of the Arab coalition to militarily intervene in Yemen conflict in 2015 was aimed to achieving a number of important strategic objectives. One, restore the legitimate government of Yemen and establish stability and security for the Yemen of Yemeni people. Second, curb Houthi her uh, threats to regional security and Iranian aggression on the Arabian Peninsula. Three, degrade and defeat AQAP and ISIS in Yemen. And fourth, securing Babel Mandeb Strait and protecting global maritime trade routes. If it was not for the intervention of the coalition, two developments with serious implication to regional and global security would have taken place. One, the consolidation in Yemen of an Iran-run and funded terrorist outfit modeled after Lebanon's Hezbollah, posing significant security threats to the region as a whole. Second, the establishment of an Al-Qaeda-run quasi-state in parts of Yemen, like what Daesh did in parts of Iraq and Syria. And no one wants to, th to see this happening. Going briefly back to the fourth strategic objective, which is securing Bab al-Mandab.
It is a strategically significant commercial point for energy shipping routes between the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean. Connecting the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, Bab el Mandeb offers the shortest trade routes between the Mediterranean, Europe, and North Africa, and the Indian Ocean and beyond, India, Japan, and East Asia. Nearly all of the maritime trade between Europe and Asia worth 700 billion US, US dollar a year passes through Bab el Mandeb Strait on the southern entrance to the Red Sea. Therefore, securing the strait was, high was of high strategic importance for global maritime trade. Bab el Mandeb is a critical location for world trade and any disruption to commercial shipping, particularly the transport of oil through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal will spell disaster. The alternative options in case of a disruption are bleak. Iran, the main supporters of the Houthi, is not new to such lethal games of disruption and destabilization. Iranian threats to pulverize the international trade by blocking the Strait of Hormuz are well known for all of us before and today. Now allow me to go into details regarding the current and the recent operation around the city and port of Hudaida. So what are the bases of the Arab coalition current operation around the city and port of Hudaida? It is very important to note that the Arab coalition intervention in Yemen, as well as the current operation in Hudaida, is based upon the former request by the legitimate internationally recognized Yemeni government and fully complies with all relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions, including 2216, 2204, 2201, and 2140. Also, the operation is based on the will of the people of Hudaida. Why liberate Hudaida and why now? Well, the port of Hudaida, a critical access point for humanitarian aid, has been illegally occupied by Houthi militias since 2015. Houthi mismanagement and neglect of the port and its facility, as well as the misconduct demonstrated in the militant group's consistent effort to delay and seize essential humanitarian aid supplies intended for Yemeni civilians, has, contribu has contributed significantly to the worsening of the humanitarian situation in Yemen. In addition, by occupying the Hudaida port, Houthi raised over three billion US dollars in revenue, which enabled them to continue financing their brutal campaign against the people of Yemen. Beyond this, the use of Hudaida port by Houthi to smuggle Iranian supplied weapons, including mines, drones, as well as ballistic missiles, which has been used to target cities in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on over 100 occasions, gravely undermines the security of the region. The exploitation of Hudaida port and its resources by Houthi has needlessly prolonged the war and only increased the suffering of Yemeni people, while directly violating key provisions of United Nations Security Council resolutions 2216, 2204, and 2201, and 2140. So has there been efforts or proposals to reach peaceful and diplomatic solution on Hudaida issue? Yes, there were many, and for a long time. UN-led negotiation in respect to handing authority of the port and its facility to a neutral third party have been ongoing for over two years. With no sign of an agreement in sight, the Arab coalition members have strongly supported the UN Special Envoy to Yemen's plan for Hudaida. However, Houthi militias have rejected all proposals and have failed to negotiate a solution to this issue in openness and good faith. 
So what is the choice left for Yemeni government and the coalition? In light of the unwillingness of the Houthi to accept a diplomatic solution and in order to secure the transfer of urgently needed humanitarian goods to Yemen, the coalition forces were provided little choice but to initiate this operation to liberate Hudaydah. These operations are based on the formal request made by the legitimate internationally recognized Yemeni government. And it's also fully supported by Arab League as expressed has, as they have expressed their full support for the coalition operation to liberate Hudaydah. To the question who is leading such operation that some may have, the operation carried out in Hudaydah are Yemeni led and supported by Arab coalition. Yemeni forces on the ground, including Tahama's resistance, which consists of volunteers from Hudaydah government. This underline the Yemeni people legitimate right and determination to end the Houthi occupation of Hudaydah. What Houthi militias are doing now in carrying the operation, the Arab coalition forces unfortunately witnessed numerous acts of Houthi war crimes in Hudaydah province. These actions include the use of civilian as human shields, the widespread recruitment of child, child soldiers, the deployment of military units and heavy equipment to civilian areas, and the prevention of civilian from leaving the city. Beyond this, Houthi militias continue to destroy critical civilian infrastructure in Hudaydah province, including water, electricity, sewage network, placing further strain on the current humanitarian situation in the city. Such actions alongside the placement of mines surrounding and close to civilian infrastructure, including the Hudaydah airport and seaport, pose a serious threat to civilian life, while also endangering international shipping in the Red Sea. This activity taken by Houthi with the support of Islamic Republic of Iran constitute a gross violation of international law and the basic human rights of Yemeni civilians. Moreover, these irresponsible actions highlight the Houthi unwillingness to resolve the Yemen crisis in a constructive and responsible fashion. Some may want to know how the operation are carried out. It is hoped that by ending the illegal Houthi occupation of Hudaydah, the Arab coalition will safeguard civilians from Houthi atrocities and better allow for the facilitation and transfer of large volumes of humanitarian aid from, from Hudaydah, while ensuring that the port's revenue and the disbursement of aid are no longer misappropriated by Houthi militias to finance and prolong the war. There are many, challenging to, many challenges to this operation, and the Arab coalition fully recognize that the challenge of Hudaydah operation is not only a military nature, but also lie in the importance of maintaining a crucial humanitarian support that the Hudaydah port provides to the Yemeni people. While engaging in this military operation, the coalition will do its utmost to ensure the port remains operational as key access point for humanitarian aid. Additionally, the Arab coalition has chosen to advance in a gradual, calibrated, and measured manner and continues to urge the Houthi to surrender the port to ensure the safety of civilians in Hudaydah. Beyond this, the coalition has allowed the highway linking Hudaydah and Sana'a to remain open, thus providing Houthi an opportunity to withdraw their armed militias. In conjunction with its military operation, the Arab coalition has also launched a large-scale and well-prepared humanitarian aid plan in order to rapidly address ongoing civilian humanitarian needs. The humanitarian aid plan in Hudaydah is closely coordinated with international aid agencies 
and non-governmental organizations operating on the ground. The logistical component of the plan also include local organization, which have deployed over 500 aid workers in and around Hideida. Furthermore, the coalition has undertaken contingency planning in order to minimize the impact of damage or, sub or sabotage carried out upon the port's infrastructure by Houthi. These plans include the delivery of aid via sea, air, and land, thus ensuring civilian return access to food, medicine, and other supplies in Hodeida. Beyond this, the coalition considers the safety and security of aid workers and their facilities to be of utmost importance. The coalition has mapped and verified the location of 1,200 humanitarian relief points in addition to schools, hospitals, and critical infrastructure prior to undertaking this military operation in Hodeida. The Arab coalition also in the process of carrying out demining operation in area liberated from Houthi forces and in areas that are crucial to the continued supply of humanitarian aid. These efforts are aimed to ensuring the safety of civilians and the continued open access to aid and are being carried out efficiently and effectively. The Arab coalition hopes the Houthi will come to recognize that a military victory in this conflict is, an, is unachievable and that their continued effort to maintain and stranglehold on Yemen's future through violence will not provide them greater influence in the ongoing political process. Finally, the Arab coalition is liaising closely with the United Nations Special Envoy to Yemen, Martin Griffith, and continues to keep to seek the international com community's support and further empowering the role of the United Nations while pressing the Houthis to reconsider their position on the transfer of the port of Hodeida and to negotiate a broader political solution to Yemen conflict. With that, I end my prepared points and I would, I would be happy to receive and answer your questions and address your comments, if any. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for your insights. I would like to open the floor to your questions. Please uh, raise your hand if you have any question and proceed to the mic. Anthony, start with Anthony. Um, <coughs> Anthony Rowley, <coughs> freelance. Um, thank you for your speech. Um, you've outlined a very complex situation in the Middle East, which for those of us who are not experts is somewhat confusing. but. Um, narrowing this down, how serious, obviously Japan depends critically on oil supplies from the Middle East. So how serious is the uh, threat to you know, security of supply from these various factors that you've talked about? And can you give any f indication of your feelings about the, the, the way the oil price is likely to move from here? Roughly $70 a barrel at the moment. There are very different views. Some people think it will go much higher. Some people think it will go lower. So any indication you're able to give of your view of where the oil price is going in the short to medium term. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, the first part of your question about how serious the threat actually on the oil supplies. I think that the uh, if this uh, situation in Yemen continues, uh, definitely there is a serious threat on the uh, uh, on the uh, uh, the trade lanes uh, from the Red Sea. Uh, uh, I think, and you have you may have heard that uh, the Aden was liberated from Houthi, and many other areas areas were liberated from Houthi and from uh, Al Qaeda in Yemen. Uh, during the last uh, couple of years uh, and they are now under the control of the legitimate uh, Yemeni government. Uh, uh, that give us a little bit more uh, uh, security uh, of course of these uh, important uh, cities and, and locations. Uh, but again, uh, I think the, secu the uh, security of these uh, passages are very important. 
and we uh, should all and the international community should all be uh, um, make it clear for for the uh, uh, Houthi uh, and uh, any parties that are supporting Houthi such as Iran in violation to the United Nations Resolution Council, uh, Council resolutions that uh, this needs to stop. The second part of your questions, um, I'm really not the expert uh, on uh, oil prices. I think this question uh, uh, comes up a lot. Uh, I may be able to give you uh, some information maybe after this, uh, after getting uh, inquiring to the uh, people who understand this topic more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Next question, please. Yes. Mm. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, please, Anthony, please. Um, completely different question, but as you know, China's what's called Belt and Road Project um, envisages a string of ports, a string of pearls, it's called, right across in, from um, uh, Asia, right through the, through the Middle East into North Africa, um, causing a lot of controversy in, in many ways. Um, Japan also has views on developing ports in the uh, Middle East area, because the, the, you know these have st tremendous strategic as well as economic importance. So how do you see the competition between Japan, between China, and other countries, including Japan, for strategic control of ports. Is this likely to lead to problems in the future, do you think? Thank you for the question. I think I can maybe um, answer the part uh, that is concerned about Japan and the UAE. Um, Japan and the UAE have a very strategic relationship and this has started more than half a century ago. Um, it was around uh, energy but has expanded lately to many other areas. Um, our partnership and Japan's partnership in the region is not uh, new. Uh, it goes back uh, more than uh, four decades and we are working with the Japanese government on many initiatives and we would like to support uh, all projects that will bring uh, benefit and prosperity and stability and peace to uh, to the region and the world. Yes. Next question, please. Yes, please. My name is Gumnani, associate member. Hearing this, uh, uh, Iran appears to have a major role in this conflict. Is there another country also besides Iran who is supporting this Houthis? Thank you for your questions. Uh, there is support. F there is support from Hezbollah uh, to the Houthi, and the support uh, is in various uh, shapes. So there are support as resources, there is support also as uh, providing advisory, there is support on how to operate uh, sophisticated uh, systems. Um, there were many uh, military systems that were not seen or did not actually, was not available in Yemen before the conflict. And uh, all of these get smuggled through Hudayda port. This is why securing Hudaydah port and making sure that the legitimate government is in control or handing this to a third party is very crucial and very important in actually making a quick uh, solution to this conflict. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. All right. Tom? Please don't ask about oil prices, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, hi, Ambassador. My name is uh, Thomas Sullivan. I'm, I'm a guest here uh, today. Um, I think the previous questioner just asked you about Iran. A as we know, the United States have, have now exited the, the JCPOA uh, agreement, and it seems like the Iranians are threatening to maybe uh, disrupt oil supplies through the Hormuz. I was just wondering if you could give us your perspectives on that, since the United Arab Emirates uh, directly borders uh, Hormuz. And secondly, I wonder if you could give us an update on the situation situation uh, with regard to the Qatar uh, blockade, because Japan is obviously very reliant on LNG from uh, the state of Qatar. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, so the first question regarding Iran and the threat, uh, Iran threatening to blockade the uh, Hormuz Strait. Um, for the UAE, um, we uh, have plans, and we have earlier actually identified this risk because these threats were not actually uh, brought today. We actually witnessed these or heard, heard these threats from Iran many years ago. What the UAE did is we had a project uh, that uh, we have a pipeline from the mainland to Fujairah Emirates, and Fujairah is on the shores of Oman's of the uh, Indi Indian uh, Ocean. So for the oil supplies from the UAE, uh, there is uh, a, an alternative plan to make sure that the oil supply actually gets out. And it's not in the area in the uh, Arabian Gulf. It doesn't have to go through the Strait of Hormuz. The second question regarding Qatar, and uh, I think it's uh, uh, the topic uh, needs a lot of time to explain, but I'll try to be brief. The basic disagreement between the uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, and Bahrain with Qatar is uh, around uh, three main issues. One, the support for terrorist organization and finance toward terrorist organizations. Second is the, inter the interference of Qatar in internal affairs of other countries. And we can see this around actually uh, the Middle East in, 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 in our countries and in other countries. Uh, third was the problem with the media. Um, Al Jazeera has an English version and has an Arabic version. We had a serious uh, uh, problem with the Arabic version, especially when there is somebody who is considered to be a uh, well-respected scholar in Islam previous, who belongs to a brotherhood group, you know, like Al-Qaradawi, stands in front, uses Al Jazeera, and in front TV, and he's saying that the suicide bombers, you know, uh, can do this and, and, and allowing jihad and thus they will go to heaven. This is totally not acceptable for us. We don't, we don't want this actually to reach to our children and our families. We are very serious about combating terrorism. And so these were the main problems. I noticed that you uh, described it as uh, a blockade. It's, it's not a blockade. It's a boycott. So these four countries has practiced their, inter their uh, sovereign right in accordance to the international law. What is happening and resulting in the action from Qatar's government policies actually is considered a very serious national threat to our country. And then we decided actually to take these proportional measures to make sure that the country and our national security and our people are protected. Now, the good thing, there is a political process in place for an order actually to reach a solution. And I think this depends on Qatar's side and how they want to take this. By the way, Qatari Airways ships, Qatar, they fly from and to Qatar freely. So there is no blockade. Also ships, yes, we decided to close our territorial airspace and water but it's open for Qatar and there are ships and flights continuing going to Qatar. There is no uh, blockade on Qatar. Thank you. All right, 
pending question. Okay, by the time you find your question, let me, Ambassador, ask you about uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, just to change the subject a little bit, if I may. Uh, these cities are gaining a lot of attention and admiration in Japan, and Emirates Airlines, along with Etihad Airlines, are uh, one of the top uh, airlines here for international travel, especially to Latin America. So how do you describe the future track of the, uh, the Japanese attention, uh, expanding Japanese attention and investment and uh, cooperation in, in, in the UAE? Uh, as we know that Dubai is the center for the biggest uh, Japanese uh, companies and the residents in the Middle East. H how do you describe the future track for this? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. And uh, since I did not have time to um, speak about this in my in my talk, um, um, the UAE is a small country. But long time ago, we have realized uh, that we have. Uh, we are in a strategic location, and this is why the UAE, uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and other uh, Emirates um, is being designed to be as a hub, linking the other Middle East areas, linking Africa, linking India, and then also all the way to Europe. Um, and the Japanese uh, companies and investments in the UAE, I think if we compare them to the other uh, countries, uh, they are significant. We have around 400 Japanese companies operating in the UAE. Um, also, we host actually the largest Japanese community in the whole Middle East and North Africa. Uh, the future, I think, uh, can hold a very good things for uh, UAE and Japan and also for the other countries. Um, by the UAE and its cities acting as a hub, I think it can be an access to other regions such as Africa. Africa is growing. In the upcoming 50 years, the Africa is going to grow much more and the population is going to raise, rapid, raise rapidly. And uh, India is also uh, developing very rapidly. Um, I think these, not only the UAE uh, market, uh, but also these, the region and also Africa and India can be a potential market for UAE and Japanese companies and also other, of course, partners from all around the world. Yes. Next question, please. We still have time, so... Anthony? Yes. Um, I believe South Korea has sort of quite strong economic interests in the UAE, including, I think, a major nuclear power station that was supplied some years ago. Um, if the Korean, not unification, but closer cooperation between North and South Korea takes place, it's reasonable to assume that South Korea will be very busy um, supplying infrastructure and other things to North Korea. So. Uh, are you concerned maybe that South Korea's involvement in the UAE may become less as a result of this changing situation on the Korean Peninsula? Thank you very much. Another uh, very difficult question. <laughs> I'll try to do my best. The relation with uh, uh, South Korea and the UAE, as you have kindly mentioned, uh, is a strong relation and the UAE Peaceful Nuclear Generation Power uh, uh, Program uh, is uh, being done with uh, in partnership with uh, companies from s from South Korea. Um, I think the relation is is strong, and um, I'm not really sure uh, what will uh, happen and how this will affect the uh, the the commitment uh, from South Korea. But let's hope that it uh, continues actually uh, being stronger uh, between the two countries. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So if I may go back to the uh, situation uh, on Yemen, I uh, I would like to 
touch upon the Japanese position. Japan supported the Arab initiative and uh, supported the uh, legitimacy in the government in Yemen. And uh, I, I think uh, they still have the same position. H how do you uh, think the Japan position now on the, on the latest uh, situation in the area? Thank you very much for the questions. Um, so we've been um, talking with the Japanese government uh, about uh, this um, issue, and Japan is uh, supportive. Um, we encourage the Japanese government and also uh, actually all governments around the world to uh, condemn the violation of the United Nations Security Council resolutions. Uh, 2216 uh, had uh, an arms embargo uh, on Yemen. Uh, weapons, ballistic missiles, and many other military equipments is continually being smuggled actually through Hudaydah to, uh, uh, to, to, to Yemen. Uh, Security Council resolutions uh, also um, uh, had called for Houthi to actually put down and their weapons and withdraw. This did not happen. There are many violations of key provisions of these United Nations Security Council resolutions. Um, we strongly think that uh, all government uh, should con condemn uh, this violation. Yes. Tom. Yes, please. Uh, hi, Ambassador. I want to just ask you as well, uh, could you give us a little bit of background about the economic situation in the United Arab Emirates? We know, for example, in Saudi Arabia, they've got vision uh, in 2030, uh, and we know also that many countries around the world are trying to reduce their uh, use of oil and gas and decarbonize their economies. H how is the United Arab Emirates preparing for this um, situation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, from the day of inception, the UAE, and the leadership of the country, and the government has realized that the oil is only a tool, and the real assets for the country are actually its people. This is why all of the revenue coming from uh, the oil were invested and developing the human resources, the people, as well as the country infrastructure. Um, we, the dependence on oil at the beginning, it was very high. It went all the way to over 80%. If we look at it today, it's less than 30%. So diversifi the diversification of the economy was actually and the UAE strategy a long time ago. Uh, it has been implemented, uh, and we uh, actually are seeing the fruits of this by reduction, the, de uh, the uh, dependence on oil. Um, you mentioned Saudi Arabia and the new 2030 vision that Saudi Arabia has. Um, definitely, this is a very welcomed uh, uh, step and development uh, and by Saudi Arabia, it will have a great and significant positive uh, effect, not only in Saudi Arabia, but in the region as a whole. So we uh, strongly support uh, this uh, vision and strategy. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador, there is a Dubai Expo, I think, in 2022. And uh, there is Osaka also, uh, event coming up soon. Uh, is there some cooperation between uh, UAE and Japan over these big events uh, on our world-class level? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and w what, what do you expect from Japan uh, regarding uh, Dubai Expo? Thank you. Um, the Expo 2020, uh, on the same year, we have the Olympics 2020. There is uh, an ongoing 
discussions and efforts between the UAE and Japan on a partnership uh, based on these two events. Um, Japan has announced its participation in the Expo 2020. We anticipate that Japan's presence will be very strong in this uh, important event that will take place for the first time in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Um, one more question, please. All right. I think uh, everybody asked the question, so I would like to wrap up the event, Ambassador. Do, do you want to have other? Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, usually we give uh, we give our guest speaker a one year honorary membership, but Ambassador uh, Alamri has uh, already uh, is is already a member honorary member. All ambassadors are already members, so we'd like to give you a special gift token gift. It's it's mango juice, as I heard. So <laughs> I hope you like it. And thank you very much, Ambassador, for coming. Mm -hmm. and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming and have a nice evening.